so thank you very much for putting this paper on the program. Um, this is joint work with my colleagues, uh, Thomas Lejeune and Gregory Divay, both of the National Bank of Belgium. And um, the opinions expressed here are not necessarily those of the National Bank of Belgium or the European System of Central Bank. So uh, in this paper, what we do is uh, we use market-based interest rate expectations as observables in the estimation of two DSG models of the euro area. And the way we incorporate these market-based interest rate expectations in the estimation follows um, the paper by Campbell et al, who was for the US uh, uh, closely. Um, uh, and we have two models which we investigate. So one is, is very close to a yeah, Chris Mason Bauter's model. Uh, and the second one is that same model, but is a model where households uh, derive utility from their government bonds. So they have preference over safe assets. And they have, uh, um, they, they also derive utility from their capital stock. Um, so they have so called capital spirit preferences. And uh, this is relevant because POSA has been shown to attenuate the effect of forward guidance shocks or like anticipated monetary policy shocks um, on economic activity. And uh, we asked two questions, namely, how does the inclusion of uh, these interest rate expectations in the data set affect the out of sample forecasting performance of, of these two models? Uh, and secondly, how um, does the contribution of the anticipated monetary policy shocks, which we can identify because we have these interest rate expectations in the data set, how does that change in response to ECB forward guidance post 2013 Q2? So um, yeah, we use this uh, change in the contribution as a measure of the effect of ECB forward guidance. And uh, what we find is uh, first of all that um, uh, that, there, that there is a large difference uh, in the empirical fit of um, the two models. Uh, so the POSA model has a much higher empirical fit um, once forward rates are included in the data set. Uh, so that data set with forward rates in there is matched much better by the, by the POSA model. Um, and then in our out-of-sample forecasting exercise, we find that uh, having interest rate expectations in the data set improves the forecasts of uh, GDP consumption and investment and the interest rate in both models. Uh, and then uh, in, in that the POSA model with interest rate expectations delivers the best forecast of GDP consumption uh, and uh, investment uh, for investment at the this is true for the for the longest forecast horizons, so more than two years. Uh, yeah, in general, the improvement of the forecast delivered by the POSA model grows in the forecast horizon. And regarding the effect of uh, uh, the forward guidance of the European Central Bank viewed through the lens of the model, we find that uh, in the model without uh, these preferences over safe assets, uh, the contribution to the GDP level accumulates to about 8.3 percentage points by 2019 to 4. So a very large effect. And the effect on inflation accumulates to 0.4 percentage points, while in the model with the preference of our safer sets, these effects are much smaller at 2.2 percentage points on the GDP level and over 1 percentage points on inflation. And uh, there is uh, there is uh, one paper in, um, which um, does something which is in some ways a bit similar to what we are doing. So I wanted to briefly discuss this here. Um, so that's uh, Christoffel et al. who uh, estimate a version of the ECB's new area right model um, using interest rate expectations and one year ahead forecasts of real GDP growth. Uh, in the data set, and they draw these uh, expectation measures from the Euro Area Survey of Professional Forecasters. Uh, in one setup, and in another, they have they take the interest rate expectations from the Euro Area Yield Curve. Uh, and the main differences um, of how, what we do with respect to their paper is 
first of all, that we use uh, throughout market interest rates to measure interest rate expectations. Uh, and um, that allows us uh, to construct a longer time series, which already starts in the pre euro area period, where in this Christopher et al. paper, um, they are measures of interest rate expectations and um, interest rate estimation only uh, after 1999. Um, uh, then uh, we find that having these interest rate expectations in the data set improves the forecast of GDP. While um, in that other paper, they do not find that. Um, and that could be partly related to the fact that we do not tie the model output growth forecast to, uh, to survey data. Um, so we, we um, that, that endogenously determined, um, determined by, uh, by the data and, and, the, and the model, uh, whereas they force the model to match you know, uh, the output growth forecast. Uh, and uh, well, and we observe the interest rate, interest rate expectations over the three-year horizon, where they maximum go, go to the maximum up to the two-year horizon, and we don't have any gaps in the uh, in the horizon of the interest rate expectation measures. And I will be more precise on on what that means. Uh, but it's it's the same approach as in Campbell et al. What Campbell et al. Um, and then uh, we uh, compare the, of course, the POSA, the no POSA model. Um, yeah, so uh, let me dive into the model and specifically I will focus on those aspects which are different from uh, standard Smiths and Walters model, which most of you will probably know um, to some degree. Uh, so uh, the household in this model uh, derives utility from consumption C and uh, this utility from labor N. Huh? Um, so that's kind of the standard part, but then it, it, it derives utility from uh, its bond holdings, its government bond holdings, whereas here in the bracket we have the sum of short-term and long-term uh, government bonds. So BGT are the short-term government bonds, BGLT are the long-term government bonds, and then this TFP term, uh, this is just the um, exogenous deterministic technology, uh, which we have in there to induce a balanced growth path. Uh, we, uh, and uh, this, this utility from these bonds uh, has, been, has been motivated in the literature uh, as a form of liquidity preference by Krishna Murphy and Wissi Jorgensen. So the idea is that if these government bonds are very liquid, uh, they provide also liquidity services. And this is captured here by um, positive utility. Uh, and uh, another argument has been that this term can proxy, as a, uh, uh, can proxy for precautionary savings, for the benefit of precautionary savings. Um, and uh, yeah, then we have this second term here, which uh, so the household also derives utility from capital, and uh, this has been motivated as a form of capital uh, of capitalist spirit uh, preferences. Um, so the idea is that really the household derives uh, utility from all forms of wealth. Um, this idea goes back to Max Weber. Uh, but in the modern, in the modern, uh, lit more modern literature, uh, it has been used by Carroll to rationalize the wealth to income ratios of rich households. So the fact that these households have such high wealth to income ratios, uh, he claimed, uh, cannot be cannot be rationalized very differently. Uh, then Humoff um, et al. used that. Uh, in a model where they want to create a link between the increase in inequality in the US and the increase in household indebtedness, and specifically the capitalist spirit preferences, they are deliver, uh, deliver a, a positive marginal propensity to save out of uh, permanent income increases. And this mechanism, and, and, for, and, and um, this uh, mechanism is also the reason this preferences have been uh, in. 
has appeared have appeared in more recent work uh, about the effect of income inequality on uh, household indebtedness and the natural rate of interest. Um, the reason we have these capitalist spirit preferences here is more mundane, and I will come to that on the next. Uh, I will come to that shortly. Um, so, um, what? Okay, why? Why are we interested here to have? I mean, why is it interesting to have these preferences over safer sets uh, in, uh, in in our like in, in this model? Uh, it has to do with the way uh, these preferences attenuate the effect of anticipated monetary policy shock or forward guidance policies. So. Uh, if we linearize the consumption Euler equation in this model and consider here the simple case of no habit formation, just to illustrate it more easily on the slide, what we find is that uh, with uh, uh, preference of our safe assets, this theta term here will be smaller than one. Um, and so will be smaller than one. And so um, uh, the effect of future of expectations of future consumption on current consumption are attenuated, and we have this wealth effect here. Yeah? Um, so, from government bonds and increase in government bonds uh, holdings uh, by lowering the marginal utility of bonds uh, increases uh, increases consumption. And uh, well, and, and, and we can and, and we can see there are two ways in which uh, thus uh, um, also attenuates the effect of forward guidance. There is a very direct uh, there is a very direct um, effect uh, that comes from the fact that this theta smaller than one the um, effect of future real interest the future real interest rate on current consumption is attenuated so that's sometimes referred to as discounting in the Euler equation uh, that's uh, that's a quite direct effect but then there's also an indirect effect here which uh, has not been discussed as much i believe um, and sometimes that's also been abstracted on like for instance in this michael that says paper they extract from that by just holding government bonds constant uh, and that's this wealth effect here so um basically if a forward guidance policy uh is successful at stimulating output and inflation uh depending on the fiscal rule uh, if the fiscal rule adjusts taxes only gradually to uh changes in government debt uh, it will also um this policy this forward guidance policy will then also tend to lower government debt uh, and if it does that, then, uh, well, POSA then attenuates also the effect on of forward guidance on consumption via that wealth effect channel. And that is, in fact, also important here. Uh, and then the question you will ask is that how do we parameterize these preferences? And what we do is that we, we estimate the curvature parameters on uh, safe assets and capital, yeah? uh, and um, we uh, calibrate uh, this, uh, we call this the discounting wedge beta. So it's the product between beta, between the discount rate, uh, the utility discount rate normalized by GDP growth rate gamma uh, and, the, and the real interest rate. And uh, we um, calibrate that uh, based on evidence on the wedge between individual discount rates and the interest rate. And uh, there is, uh, yeah, in the different paper I've collected empirical evidence on this wedge. Um, and then we assume that the real return on that the real return on capital after accounting for depreciation equals here for simplicity, the real safe interest rate. And uh, these two assumptions on the theta and the second assumption here, then given sigma B and sigma K, pin down the utility rates on uh, government bonds and capital. Uh, and that completes the parameterization of the, the preference parameters. So the next thing which is different here uh, uh, and, and this relates to, to observe the observables we have in the model uh, eventually, 
uh, is, uh, is relates to the monetary policy rules. So first of all, and this monetary policy rule here, this interest feedback rule, we have this inflation objective term, pi opt uh, t. Uh, and this we have in the model because, as I will tell you later, we have also a measure of uh, a long term inflation expectations in the data set. Um, and then uh, we have two types of monetary policy shocks here. So we have the contemporaneous monetary policy shock, epsilon RT. Uh, this will accommodate, as usual, the inclusion of the short-term interest rate in the data set. And then we have these anticipated monetary relief policy shock terms, or so epsilon IRT, uh, uh, T minus I, uh, summed up from I to capital H. Uh, so, um, okay, so obviously, what, what do these shocks do? I mean, if, if for instance, uh, epsilon 1, uh, epsilon superscript one RT uh, increases. This means that we have a shock which will have a direct positive effect on the policy rate in period T plus one, one period from now. Uh, and these shocks uh, will accommodate the inclusion of the interest rate expectations. So we have exactly as many of these shocks, these anticipated monetary policy shocks, as we have inflation, as we have uh, interest rate expectation variables in the data set. Uh, we assume that these uh, anticipated monetary policy shocks follow an AR1 process, just like the, the standard uh, contemporaneous monetary policy shock. Uh, and then on the fiscal policy side, there are some uh, differences as well. So we include uh, long term government debt in this economy. Um, and the reason we are doing that is, in a nutshell, is to reduce um, the effect of the short-term interest rate on the stock of outstanding debt. That matters for us because we have, within the BOSA model, we have this, this wealth effect uh, from government debt. Um, so in this setup by Klaus and Moyon, a short-term debt is in zero net supply and a fraction omega LTD of long-term debt matures each quarter. So we have stochastic repayment. Um, and then the interest rate cost of the government, uh, RGLT, is in fact a weighted average of interest rate on debt issued in past quarters. Uh, where whenever the step is issued, then households take into account, um, like the, the interest rate on that newly issued debt takes into account, of course, the evolution of the expected short-term interest rate. Um, and yeah, this then leads to this government budget constraint where the stock of outstanding long-term debt depends on past long-term debt times the average interest rate cost, RGLT minus one, and then on the right, you have the primary deficit with government expenditure and, uh, and uh, to tax revenues uh, from labor taxes, consumption taxes, and profit taxes. And uh, we assume that um, uh, there is a fiscal rule in the model which adjusts. Uh, lump sum taxes uh, here expressed as a percentage of steady state GDP as well as the labor and the consumption tax rate. Uh, these, these, um, the fact that we assume that these fiscal instrument of arrival relates again to the observables, the fiscal observables we are going to include. And the fiscal rule we have here then is quite standard. So we have, um, this is written down here for the case of the lump sum tax, the lump sum tax response uh, to uh, re a response to, to output. Uh, the response parameter here is, is estimated. The response to output and it responds to this U hat T term and this U hat T term uh, captures endogenous persistence. So it's related to its own lag and it's, it captures a response to the depth level, BG hat LT minus one. Uh, and it also includes the stochastic shock where we also have an anticipation effect here. Um, so um, this, this is something which has been found important in the literature, estimating uh, models on fiscal data. That, uh, so that part of the, uh, 
part of a change in the fiscal instrument, let's say a tax rate is already anticipated one quarter ahead. Um, yes, then uh, let's turn to the uh, to the observation equations of the interest rate variables, uh, uh, where we also have something which is uh, different from the standard setup. So STI is the measure of the contemporaneous short-term interest rate. Uh, this observation equation here is uh, this is something you uh, you will recognize so we re uh, relate the short-term interest rate observable to the uh, deviation of the interest rate from its steady state in the model um, and then uh, what may be new to you is uh, this um, STIX IT this is the measure of interest rate expectations uh, for horizon I and this is related to the average expected short-term interest rate in the model um, so uh, over over horizon I, uh, so for instance, if STI uh, 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 for I, the horizon is two, so two quarters, then we have here the average short-term interest rate over um, average over the next quarter and in two quarters from now. Um, there are two remarks uh, which are in order here with respect to this, uh, these um, observation equations. So, um, first of all, Campbell and I argue um, that an estimation which takes into account interest rate expectations in this way uh, automatically respects the effect of lower bound because it forces uh, interest rate exp uh, ex the expected short-term interest rate to exceed the effective lower bound yeah, because it is forced to equal the expected uh, the expected interest rate. Uh, and then uh, the second thing you may notice uh, is that this measurement equation extracts from term premia. And uh, well. The, the reason we, we do this or we think this is justifiable is that there is evidence that uh, by Lloyd uh, 2021 that OIS rates are accurate measures of expectations of the short term interest rates in the euro area, the United States, and Japan and the UK, at least over the two year horizon. Um, and we also find in our sample that the sample average of the interest rate expectations uh, rises only little relative to the sample average of the short-term interest rate uh, in the horizon I. So, uh, I mean, the maximum horizon we are going to have, so the maximum capital H we are going to have is 12, so three years. And... Um, yeah, three-year uh, interest rate, three-year expected interest rate over the next three years. So SDIX uh, 12 is only, like the average of that is only like 0.3 percentage points higher than, than, than uh, in the sample. Uh, then, uh, okay, where where does this interest rate expectations data which we include come from? And let me talk a little bit about that. So, um, our like what we always try to make sure is that the uh, interest rate expectation data we use uh, is consistent with the measure of the short term interest rate we use. So, um, for instance, over the period uh, uh, after this, from the start of the euro area onwards. Uh, our measure of STI is the Ionia quarterly average. So that's an overnight interest rate, and we take the quarterly average uh, of that. Uh, and then we take, uh, for measures of STIX, we take from the end of the quarter, uh, we take uh, OIS rates, which are which have as the, the underlying interest rate the, the Ionia. Uh, and then from 1994 Q1 to 1998 Q4, we help ourselves with the Euribor. So our SD, SDMI is the three month Euribor from the beginning of the quarter. Uh, and then um, the STIX for the horizon one to four quarters are the corresponding Euribor rates uh, from, the, from the end of the quarter. Uh, yeah, so that the, the expectation that, for instance, uh, of like STIX1 really covers uh, the S STI, uh, the STI T plus one. Um, 
And then for quarters, for horizons of five to 12 quarters, we attach, uh, we use government bond fields, uh, which we which we uh, which we compute where we compute a euro area average from zero one years obtained from the BIS, uh, and we adjust those for the difference between the four quarter oil rebor and the government bond interest rates with the maturity of four quarters. Um, yeah, and then for 1990, 1990 to nineteen ninety three, um, we use. Uh, the three month money market rate for the short term interest rates and then rate rate and then euro market rates for the for the STIX for horizons I one to four quarters and then for five to twelve quarters we again use this government bond yields. Uh, the other data we use are uh, first of all we have these five year forward five year ahead inflation expectations. Uh, and there we use from 2005 to one uh, inflation link swap rates uh, and the expectation component uh, thereof, which has been estimated by Kamba, Mendes, and Werner. And we use data from an update of that, which uh, was provided to us from people from the ECB. Um, uh, but actually, the series is also very close to, uh, to uh, data uh, published by. Uh, by the ECB Capital Market Division in a recent uh, monthly uh, bulletin article. Um, so I did very closely track that as well. Um, then from 1992 to 2004 to four, we used data which was collected by Stevens and Bauters from Consensus Economics Forecast. Uh, then on the macro side, uh, macro data side, we use the uh, seven series, which have often been used in the estimation of these three models, GDP, consumption, private investment, the real wage, employment, and GDP, and we take and, and, and the GDP data inflation, and we take those from the area wide model database. Uh, we include interest rates, inflation, and permanence and levels. Um, employment, we uh, decompose. Uh, um, and, and we, we decompose in the following way. So L and N is, is total employment in heads, uh, and population a pop is with population, and we decompose this employment to population ratio uh, into the employment rate. So one minus the unemployment rate, uh, L and N over L of N, L of N is the labor force, and the labor force to population ratio. And then this employment rate is stationary over the sample. So we don't have to uh, do anything. We can include that directly in the estimation. And then we, but then we remove a linear trend from the labor force to population ratio and include the residual of that. And then on the fiscal side, we have the deficit to GDP ratio, the direct tax revenue to GDP ratio, and the implicit consumption tax rate, which we take from the Euro Area Fiscal Database. Uh, of Paredes et al. And the deficit to GDP ratio, um, having that in there, means that we implicitly also take into account the dynamics of government debt, the government debt level. Uh, and uh, that uh, is, well, that we have in there in the estimation in order to discipline the, uh, the estimate of the, the, the Sigma V product, the um, uh, utility curvature of the state assets, which governs the wealth effect from government bonds. Uh, and then on the shock side, we have the standard seven shocks of Smiths and Walters. Um, and then we have three fiscal shocks through the lump sum tax, the labor and the consumption tax rate. Uh, we have a time varying inflation target shock, and then we have capital age anticipated monetary policy shocks. So always as many monetary policy shocks as we have interest rate expectations in the in the data set. Um, and uh, yeah, the prior distributions for the non-fiscal rule related parameters are all from are close to Smiths and Bowers and Christophe et al. Uh, and uh, we have used relatively wide priors on the fiscal rule coefficients compared to, to the literature. Um, 
Uh, yes, uh, now let me now come to the results of the estimation. So, um, and let me focus uh, on the effect of the forward rates on the parameter estimates, uh, because uh, that is something which uh, maybe, yeah, you haven't been, uh, yeah, you haven't encountered yet, maybe. So, um, so um, we so basically in, including these so we, we include I should mention we we, uh, we have two variants of having these we consider two variants of including the interest rate expectations in the data set one is with the horizon of eight quarters so we have STIX up until capital H equal to eight and twelve quarters so three years. Uh, and what we find is that uh, having these in the data set uh, strongly increases the estimated persistence of the risk premium shock compared to a version of the model which does not have the interest rate expectations. So the risk premium shock, just as a reminder, this is a shock which raises the demand for safe assets at the expense of consumption and capital. Um, so that's the key demand shock in the Smiths and Bartles model, you could you could say. Um, and uh, yeah, the model uses this shock to match the downward trend of the forward curve, um, uh, which which we see over the sample. Um, I will show that on the next slide without increasing GDP and inflation. Um, so I've just reprinted the Euler equation here. This epsilon V is the risk premium shock, just a reminder how this enters, this affects consumption. And um, yeah, this, this graph just plots the implied forward rates. So the forward rates implied by the interest rate expectation data uh, uh, we have in the model and it plots here the forward curves for different points in time from 1992, 1993 until 2019 here in orange. Uh, here on the horizontal axis, you have the horizon. And obviously this forward curve shifts downwards uh, as basically interest rates have trended downwards. And it also, uh, you could say it also becomes, becomes flatter, um, especially towards the very end. Uh, and uh, well, basically, uh, if we would have, I mean, of course, this this interest rate um, downward trend, you also have, if you don't have interest rate expectations in the model, but uh, if you have interest rate expectations in the model, then um, uh, then basically uh, you 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 have to like this this has to be incorporated in the expectations of the agent. Uh, and therefore, the model then doesn't just want a series of risk premium shocks, it wants a series of persistent risk premium shocks. And so, yeah, as I said, the risk premium shock becomes very persistent and becomes close to a unit root. Um, and as a result of that, uh, particularly the periods of low growth in the euro area become more forecastable. And then in order to avoid excessive stiff inflation, the model also wants a higher, uh, more normal rigidity in the form of a higher wage, uh, a lower, sorry, wage Phillips curve slope, which collapses here from 0.0074 to 0.002. The price Phillips curve slope also strongly declines and the fixed cost parameter increases, which as people who know these models may, may know, um, uh, basically increases the returns to scale in the model. Uh, and also then that also means that the, that the Phillips curve becomes essentially better. Um, and there's more tailors, there's more smoothing in the tailor rule as well. Uh, by contrast, in the Pulsar model, we have smaller changes in these parameters, smaller increases in normal rigidity and fixed cost parameter. Uh, and then what we find is that the Pulsar model in sample has a much higher fit, uh, especially once we include the interest rate expectations in the data. So without SPIX, the uh, difference in the marginal likelihood is 14 points, uh, and this then increases to 42 points once we have the interest rate expectations in the, in the data set. Um, let me now turn to the uh, effect of the anticipated monetary policy shocks over the different horizons. And uh, so this shows the, the no POSA model in the black line, the POSA model in the red line. Uh, and what you see here uh, that's quite straightforward is that the 
effects of these anticipated monetary policy shocks are much smaller in the POSA model, as we would expect based on what I've said. Uh, this graph also shows the kind of experiments which uh, you may have seen before also. So an interest rate cap in this case of 0.2 percentage points below the steady state. Um, and here on the horizontal axis are varied the duration and the vertical axis plots the peak effect. And this is also something where the effect is much smaller in the POSA model. Um, and then in the no POSA model. Um, so again, you have here the red line being much smaller than the, than the black line. Um, the cross line here shows the POSA model without the wealth effect. So where you have the discounting effect, but not the wealth effect. And there you can see that the attenuation of the effect of forward guidance is also driven by this wealth effect, not just by the discounting. Uh, let me now turn to the out of sample forecasting exercise we perform. So we use vintages from the array but model database and the statistical data warehouse from 1980 to one onwards. We re-estimate the models once a year. Uh, we have a pseudo out of sample forecasting period ranging from 2004 to 2093. So we have 76 data points for one quarter at forecast and 65 for 12 quarter heads forecast. Um, and we have, uh, and we compare the, uh, to, uh, and we compute the forecast error by comparing uh, the forecast to the final uh, data uh, vintage. And uh, this graph plots the root mean squared error. Um, of um, relative to the model without uh, po uh, POSNA and without SPX in the data set. Yeah? So one corresponds to the model which does not have preference over CFS heads and which is estimated without the interest rate expectation data. Uh, and what we see is that once we include interest rate expectations in the data, so we have see here the blue dashed line, uh, we have a strong improvement in the forecasted performance of output, uh, consumption, and investment. Um, and inflation, but only much less so and only for shorter horizon. Uh, and the interest rate forecast, perhaps unsurprisingly so, also improves a lot. Um, and then we have a further improvement with the POSA model for output and consumption. And for investment, it's a bit more ambiguous, but for the long forecast horizons, uh, like beyond, uh, uh, yeah, two years, uh, the forecast also improves there. And okay, now let's now let's dive a little bit into where these improvements come from. Uh, so let's look first, ask first, uh, where does the improvement related to the interest rate, including interest rate expectations in the data come from? Uh, and uh, this, uh, this graph plots the uh, forecast error of GDP. Uh, so the, the, um, so, the, so the, the forecast error of uh, cumulated GDP growth cumulated over the three-year horizon. Yeah? Uh, and uh, what we see is we compare, if you compare the no-posa and the no-posa STIX model, so this black line and this blue dashed line here. Uh, what we find is that the uh, is that the um, no posa model is is more optimistic and in that sense further away from the group except more excessively optimistic we could say than the posa model when forecasting dates uh, when forecasting dates um, uh, yeah, exactly around uh, 2007, uh, 2008. So here, yeah, this black line um, uh, is is larger than the is larger than the than the blue uh, than the blue dashed line. Uh, uh, and then again, when forecasting uh, when forecasting data, uh, so over here you have the forecasted dates yeah, around uh, 2012 to four to 2015. And um, uh, 
and um, we can uh, and, and, and here we have decomposed the forecast uh, over a three-year horizon starting in 2005 Q1. Uh, decomposed it into the different into the different shocks uh, here for the no posa model and here on the right hand side for the no posa model with interest rate expectations. Uh, and what you can see here is that the uh, the more optimistic forecast of the no posa model is driven by the demand shocks, which is essentially the risk premium shock. Um, so basically what we have here is we have, because the risk premium shocks estimate to be less persistent, we have a faster recovery uh, in the no posa model uh, without expectations. Uh, and that leads to an excessively of optimistic forecast then in the no posa model with interest rate expectations where uh, the risk premium shock is far more persistent. So I say recovery because basically before the forecasting period here, uh, there is there before 2005, there is a bit of a slump uh, or like a weak growth period. Um, and yeah, in the model without interest rate expectations, uh, this period, uh, this downturn is a series of result of a series of surprises, you could say. Uh, whereas in the model with interest rate expectations, it's more, it's more expected. Um, Okay, then let's compare the POSA model with interest rate expectations to the no POSA model with interest rate expectations. And there we find that the POSA model with interest rate expectations is less over optimistic yeah, when predicting, the, uh, 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 predicting a range of periods, namely the 2003 Q4 to 2005 Q4, uh, 2008, 2011. Q3 and 2007 to 2019 Q2. So um, yeah, you can see that. Uh, you can see that, for instance. Um, yeah, you can see that. You can see that, for instance. Yeah, around here where this red line is smaller than is, is lower than the blue line. Yeah. Uh, so the forecast error is is is, is smaller and thus closer to zero. Um, and uh, yeah, then there are also periods where it's it's uh, less overly where the POSA model is less overly pessimistic. Uh, and what we will and, and, and the reason for this is that the um, that in the no POSA model the anticipated monetary policy shocks push the forecast in the wrong direction. So. For instance, here we have decomposed the forecast starting. Uh, in 2007 Q3, 2007 Q2 is the last in sample date. Uh, and what you can see here is that this green bar, the anticipated monetary policy shocks, push the forecast upwards towards the end of the forecast horizon. Uh, whereas this is not the case in the uh, in the um, in the POSA model. Uh, so we can relate this. Uh, we can relate uh, here the superior positive forecast performance of the POSA plus STIX model to a weaker effect of the anticipated monetary policy shock. Uh, and uh, this uh, is also the case during this period, and, and this is, can also be found during the period where the uh, no POSA model is more is excessively pessimistic, more, more excessively pessimistic. We are also, um, you have these green bars, which exert a very negative effect, uh, a growing negative effect over the forecast horizon in the no POSA model, whereas in the POSA model, this is uh, not the case. And this is, uh, um, this, is, uh, this is interesting because of the, well, I mean, I've showed you that the effect of the anticipated monetary policy shocks is smaller in the, in the, POSA, in the POSA model. Uh, okay, let me then turn to the effect of forward guidance. So, um, or the way we measure that, to the to our measurement of the effect of forward guidance. Uh, so, explicit forward guidance in the euro area started in July 2013 and was then strengthened in 2014 and 2015. Uh, and we uh, measure the effect of forward guidance uh, as the total change in the contribution. Of the anticipated monetary policy shock uh, post 2013 Q2. 
uh, to the level of GDP. And uh, you can see here in the NOPUSA model, uh, there are again these green bars. If you can see how these uh, green bars, the negative effect from these green bars becomes much smaller uh, during this period uh, after the ECB starts its forward guidance. Uh, so there you can already guess that the effect is going to be quite big. Whereas in the POSA model, yeah, if you flip here to the next graph, the effect on the green bars is, first of all, it's smaller throughout the sample, but also then it changes less here um, uh, after the start of the ECB forward guidance period. And uh, well, what we find then is the uh, contribution of the anticipated monetary policy shocks uh, accumulates to 2.2 percentage points in the POSA model, whereas in the no POSA model, it's 8.3 percentage points. Uh, and on inflation, then there's also a difference. So um, this is, um, I should say, Q4 over Q4 uh, inflation. Uh, so there we have, um, uh, we have 0.1 percentage points uh, in the POSA model and in the no POSA model, um, uh, 0.4 percentage points. And that brings me to the end of the presentation. So uh, we have estimated, we estimate in this paper two digits G models, one with preference over safe sets uh, and capitalist spirit preferences and one without these preferences. Uh, and uh, we uh, include, apart from macro data, we include measures of interest rate expectations in the data set of a horizon of up to 12 quarters. Uh, and uh, we find that the in center fit of the POSA model is much higher than the no POSA model, once forward, especially once forward rates are included in the data set. Um, we find in our forecasting exercise that having the interest rate expectations data in the model improves the out of sample forecasts of GDP, consumption, investment, and the interest rate. Uh, and that the POSA model with interest rate expectations delivers the best forecast of GDP, consumption, and investment at, uh, and investment at long horizons. Um, and uh, yeah, the effect of ECB forward guidance is much higher in the no POSA model than in the model with preference of state Um Yeah, thank you very much for your uh, attention. And uh, that's, that's it for me.